Um, it's very nice to see you all. Good evening. Welcome to 66 Portland Place, the home of the Royal Institute of British Architects. I am Simon Alford, currently president of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Thank you for joining us on this sweltering uh, evening to celebrate our 2023 Royal Gold Medal Lecture by Yasmin Lari, who will be in conversation with one of her two nominators. Her nominators being um, Adam Caruso of Caruso Sindon and Alicia Moronika Fisher of Migrants Bureau. This is the second gold medal of my term as president. Last year we selected the um, notable architect Balkrishna Doshi, also um, from the Southern Hemisphere. But tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Pakistan's first female architect, Professor Yasmin Lari, as the 2023 Royal Gold Medalist. This award was unanimously selected by the judges, Cindy Walters, Nilsha Saw, Ivan Harbour, the artist Cornelia Parker, and myself. And it is the first to be personally approved by His Majesty the King, Charles III. And it acknowledges Yasmin Lari's work championing, in her words, zero carbon, self-built concepts for displaced po populations. Lari has in fact had a long and illustrious career. One could say almost two careers, one in a traditional model of practice and the other working for the foundation she founded with her husband. She has been a revolutionary force in Pakistan. She's had an immeasurable influence on the trajectory of architecture, the career of female architects, and humanitarian work in Pakistan and beyond. Since officially retiring from her traditional career in 2000, she transferred her attention to work full-time to create accessible, environmentally friendly construction techniques to help people below the poverty line and communities displaced by natural disasters and the impact of climate change. Importantly, her work empowered them to, 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 to rebuild their lives, often from the debris, modest materials from the debris of disaster, and skilled, gave them the skills to help themselves. And that's a very important, distinctive quality of her work. Uh, Yasmin Lari had, in fact, co-founded the Heritage Foundation of Pakistan with her husband, Sahal Zahir Lari, in 1980. So she was running two models of practice, pioneering the design of self-built sustainable shelters and helping to create over 50,000 dwellings. She's also known for the cook stoves which she um, brought forward, working with communities of which there are now over 80,000. An echo alternative to traditional stone, it reduces uh, emissions, tackles unfavorable environmental health, but also helps communities come together and rebuild themselves. It, rebuild, it uses architecture to build community. Yasmin Lari was born in 1941 in Pakistan. She moved to London with her family when she was 15. After finishing school, she studied art for two years before being accepted into the School of Architecture at Oxford Brookes University, then Oxford Polytechnic. And indeed, some of you may have been here not that long ago when she uh, gave the annual lecture on behalf of her school here. After graduating in 1964, Yasmin Lari returned to Pakistan at the age of 23 with her husband to establish her own architectural firm, Lari Associates going to work for major government, business, and financial institutions. Since her retirement in 2000, she has focused solely on her humanitarian work, which has leveraged international recognition. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank ARPA tonight, who are sponsors of the Royal Gold Medal. You may, I think you should know, that it's important that you're aware that the Royal Gold Medal is the product of the nominations of members. So the committee is presented with a set of uh, nominations by a group of nominees. It's very important that it is a kind of open call for the profession to identify those who it thinks have made an outstanding contribution, very much um, as is the case today. The 2024 Honorary Fellows come in a similar way. So the RIVA Gold Medal 2024 which will be under our new um, president, Marie Rocky, is now of open for calls. So please do submit your nominations. I would now like to welcome the 2023 Royal Gold Medalist, Yasmin Lari, and her nominator, Alicia Moronika Fisher, to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. 
Hello everyone and welcome to ROBA's 2023 Royal Gold Medal Awards um, in conversation with Yasmin Lari. My name is Alicia Moroni K. Fisher, I'm the founding director of Migrants Bureau and on behalf of Part W I'll be facilitating our conversation tonight exploring and celebrating the brilliance of Yasmin, especially when it comes to advocation for low carbon, traditional building materials and methodologies created to enhance the lives of those who have often been displaced or marginalised. Before we dive right into the conversation, I first met Yasmin eight years ago, which is almost full circle, as I came to your talk at the ROBA when I was a keen student, interested in climate change, adaption, resilience, and also disaster relief in relation to architecture, being able to sit in a room and listen to these active projects, the issues, the challenges, the solutions that have commenced, and the experiences of, of the women and the local communities inspired everyone in the room. As the need and urgency for tools to avoid displacement occur, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight and to be in conversation with the acknowledgement of your Royal Gold Medal Award. So first and foremost, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alicia, and good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I know how hot it's been. So wonderful that you would all make it here. And I have to thank Simon for this really very kind introduction. Thank you so much, Simon. So, um, well, I'm here and uh, I can't thank uh, the RIBA enough and also nominators who somehow, you know, brought me to the fore. And uh, it's just wonderful to be back here at 66 Portland Place. So thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Now, shining more light on you, could you tell us more about what the Royal Gold Medal Award means to you, especially as the recognition from the Royal Gold Medal Award for women is still so rare and a major cause of celebration? Well, of course, uh, it's such a great honor, and um, I, I just I was stunned when uh, I was conveyed the news by, by Simon, uh, because I never thought that working for the poor will get me any kind of recognition or any kind of attention from anybody. So uh, this was wonderful, but I have to thank really the whole group of women who are trying, or had tried so hard to get another woman up there, and uh, it shows that the world is changing. It also shows that uh, uh, we need young people to become activists, like you've done, and your group, and uh, that's the only way we can really somehow change uh, how things are going. And all of us can do that, and all of us must do that, especially in the profession of architecture. And what was your first impression when you first were awarded? What, sorry, say it again? What was your first impression when you were first awarded? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I thought, um, I thought, I thought it was a very bold decision and I couldn't believe that they could have taken it and I really thought they might be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, because it was so, uh, it was so different from any uh, other, uh, you know, ones that had been awarded this, this particular medal. And so, but it, it's been wonderful, of course, since then because I've received just so much goodwill because of this from all parts of the world. So it's been amazing for me. Yes, thank you. Yes. So notably, the list of your awards are incredibly inspiring and well-deserved. These include the Star of Distinction in 2006 and a Crescent of Distinction in 2014 from the President of Pakistan. You became a National Advisor to UNESCO Consultant in 2003. And in 2016, you received the highly acclaimed Fukuoka Prize from Japan from Asian Art and Culture. Since beginning in architecture, what drew you into the design world and what had your journey been like? What has it been like? My journey? Yeah. Oh my God, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, we're talking of last century, you must remember, and all of you are very young. I don't know whether you even remember. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, um, I, I think it's been just wonderful in countries like mine where there's so many opportunities. You wouldn't believe that and you wouldn't think that. But actually, there are just so many different uh, aspects that are still untouched or not being given enough attention to. And uh, uh, if you're practicing as an architect in, in, in my country, in countries like mine, uh, there's just so many opportunities to work at many different levels. And uh, because, uh, I mean, there's a, the society is stratified. You can work up there at that level, and you can also work at the bottom in that, in that way. So that gives you huge opportunities Plus, uh, yes, we have diverse heritage. It's wonderful heritage that we have. And so if you get involved in that, you can do something about that. But I think uh, 
When I look back, although I had a chance of doing many things and many kind of projects, but really I think the one that I'm doing now is the most rewarding. I have to tell you this because I think there's a field that mostly architects have not adopted, but I think it's just amazing how much work can be done there. And so I'm hoping that uh, with RBA taking this, as I said, a very bold decision, that that means that many young architects will feel that they can also get engaged in this kind of work. And I know there are so many that have spoken with me, with me. there are so many that have been in touch with me, and I know they want to do many things. So we have to see how we make a go of that, how we help them to be able to do it. Definitely. Are there any challenges where you look back and you're just like grateful that you've, you've overcome them? Well, <laughs> you know, when you have a long life like mine, there's so many things that have happened to you. And of course, there are challenges. And, uh, but I was very fortunate. I was very uh, privileged to have a very strong support system. Uh, you know, within my family, uh, by many people around me. But I think what we have to understand is that if you take up any causes, then as a woman, you're very vulnerable. So you have to decide whether you want to, uh, want to fight it out or do you want to just, you know, let things be. And I feel that in countries like mine where there are so many injustices, you have to take on those causes and you have to fight for them. And again, I was very fortunate, I was very lucky that I managed to get going and in spite of whatever came, it was okay, I managed it. And as I said, you know, my support system was there, my family was there, my, you know, my children, my husband. One of them is sitting here, actually. My son has come from California. So uh, they've, I've had full support all my life, and that has helped me. Because for women, and there are lots of women I see here, uh, it is very difficult to fight for anything unless you have a good support or you know, supported fully uh, by your family. So I hope all families do that so women can do much better and they can be much stronger. Amazing. Part Derby, the campaign group who've been advocating for the rights of women and our contribution to the built environment, have paved the way and provided opportunities for countless women like yourself to be recognised. Um, despite more needing to be done, how do you believe we can engage more women in the diversity of our industry um, and keep them engaged? Because I think sometimes, yes, it's very challenging and I guess if you don't necessarily have that support system, it's very easy to kind of like move into different spaces or feel like as you mentioned before, like you're very vulnerable. So how do, we, how do we continue to keep that engagement? Well, I think women have to be strong because you have to fight your own battles regardless. And uh, I think society has to be far more supportive than it has been so far, anywhere in the world actually, whether it's the global north or in the global south. This is what I feel. I have never worked in countries like yours, but I do know from my discussions with other female professionals that there are difficulties. And so I would really like very much that society per se uh, now becomes much more supportive and provide them the possibility of becoming as productive as anybody else. That's all we need really. Mm. And what does it also mean for architects to listen more or listen enough? Sorry, say it again? What does it mean for architects to listen or listen enough when it comes to the advocacy? Yeah. Well, I, I think young architects are listening a lot, actually, I have to say, because I think uh, all of young architects that I speak with or I'm in touch with are very aware of the challenges that, they, that the world faces today. And they know that there's a lot of contribution they can make, but they can't find a way to do it because we've not made it possible or given them the opportunity or given them the support that's necessary. So I think it would be wonderful if all institutions, all architectural institutions, and uh, all others uh, provide the support that's needed for young architects to go ahead and, and do all kinds of diverse activities. I mean, there's no need for us to anymore just wait for commissions, I think. And I mean, like you're doing with your Migrants Bureau, it's like really charging out another way of, of helping communities and getting out there in the built environment and playing a role, which I think is so important, which only architects can play. And I, we were talking uh, just earlier on with Iwim, and you know, I, I really feel that uh, 
it's very important for architects to now find, uh, I mean, they should be in the forefront of many of these battles that we are fighting today, whether it's the environment, whether it's climate change, whether it's communities, whether, you know, whatever injustices there are in terms of, you know, what we see around us. And uh, architects are best suited to do that, and they should use those abilities to be able to uh, create a better world. Um, this project uh, that we have here is part of the UN World Habitat Prize, which you developed for the Tula's cook stove, which enabled non-literate women res residing in suburban rural regions to raise awareness of the implications of um, open flame cooking. Um, something as basic as cooking everyday meals, increase the risk of skin uh, burn, serious uh, respiratory um, or heart diseases. And then since then, the Heritage Foundation of Pakistan um, has created this initiative where you would pay the entrepreneurs the equivalent of $2 for each woman they trained in building a stove and cover the $6 cost of materials culminating in just an $8 spend per stove. So um, how has it been kind of creating that ecosystem of Barefoot Entrepreneurs and the Barefoot um, um, Academy? Well, again, uh, because my country uh, suffers from really very high levels of poverty. Uh, there are people who literally have uh, nothing and they have to survive. And so they're the best ones to use the resources around them. And that's what I learned from them. That if I was to just see what is around and help them to use them, then they would be able to have a better life. And what I learned was that architecture can be a tool to give agency to those who have no other voice. And if you do that, then th there's a certain creativity. And that's why co-building for me is so important because these women who are really downtrodden, nobody ever talks of them or talks with them or thinks of their problems, that they then, uh, if, if they are given the simple tools like use of uh, you know, their own kind of uh, skills that they have developed over, over time, which is to maybe just knead the flour. And so they make the best, uh, best clay products. And you give them a chance with clay, and they make these beautiful, you know, arrangements. There's just amazing creativity that comes to fore. And so basically, architecture becomes a tool for them to be able to express themselves because they have other, no other means of expressing. And also, because I work in the flood area, so uh, I feel, and I've learned from tradition and heritage, as you might know about me, I am always learning from all around. Uh, we have this fantastic Bronze Age city called Mohenjo-Daro, which is about 5,000 years old. And it's surviving because it's on, on platforms. And so in the floods, if you're building, if you just elevate everything, then you can be safer. I can't say with climate change you'll be safe, but you can be safer. So I learned to, I learned to you know, use that particular way of building, and that has made many of my communities really now survive the flood, especially the stove, the earthen stove that you mentioned. But I have to correct you, Alicia, because it's not, I don't pay anything to anybody. I've just trained them. <laughs> I've just trained the people where well, my barefoot entrepreneurs, the bees, they go and they guide others to be able to build in that way. And so it's an absolutely zero cost to donor project where women themselves learn. They are the ones who invest. They are the ones who pay a fee to the barefoot entrepreneur. And that's how they build. So 60,000, 80,000 you said, in the, because of the recent floods, we've got, come up to about 130,000 now. Because people are just, women are just building themselves. So that's what we need, need to do with, with people who have nothing or where nobody's willing to invest into them. Then if you bring up their capacity, if they get the training they need, if they get the guidance they need, they can do wonders. And that's all we need to do, really. Can you take us also on a journey of the making and the building as well, the process? Well, you see, because Pakistan is so vulnerable, it's the seventh most vulnerable country in terms of climate change and disasters that we see. So 
we have to build for disasters, but we never do, we never learn. And my dream really is that if everybody can learn how to build safer buildings, then they will not be displaced. That is the biggest tragedy in anybody's life. I hope nobody ever has to go through that, where whether it's a flood or an earthquake, everything is gone because nothing has been built in a manner that it will withstand. So there's no climate resilience in any of the structures. And I've always felt that since I've been working in the field for some time now, that the only thing we need to do is to give the people the tools to train them, to make them understand how to build so that they will be safe. And if we can get to everybody, then the next flood, hopefully, they'll be okay. Uh, so that's another way of looking at, uh, at what we need to do with communities. It's not like the usual standard way that we, we, we learn about architecture or the way we, uh, you know, we're trained. But I think that architects can very well relate to that kind of situation because they know how to relate to context. And then they can help people do much better. So that's why I very much like, I keep on making this plea, so <laughs> I, I, I just want designers and architects to be in the forefront with all this. They are not there right now. And I think I'd like to see many of the young ones to be there. Um, so one of the projects that you're currently working on is the donor project. Could you tell us more about how that's come about and then also um, what targets you want to meet? <coughs> the zero donor project, <laughs> okay. Well, you see the problem is that, uh, that in Pakistan with the flood that happened last year, 33 million people have been displaced. Now, that's really, I think, almost the size of the United Kingdom, I would imagine. At least the spread is that much. And uh, that means it translates into three million households that are displaced today. They have literally nothing. There's nothing, no cover for them. There's no food for them. Total insecurity of all kinds. And so I tried um, since last September, I, I floated this holistic model, which I, is totally at variance with uh, the usual international colonial charity model, which aims at really with very little investment to make people self-reliant. And I did a pilot of a thousand families and did extremely well. Within six months, they were all perfectly able to fend for themselves. And then I floated the whole, my one million plan in Pakistan in December of last year. And I was hoping that everybody like the World Banks and donor agencies and I don't know, there's so many of them, UN system, uh, all the INGOs, NGOs would come forward because it was really very inexpensive, only I think about 130 or 40 pounds per family and they would have been able to be on their way. Uh, but when I reviewed in April, in, in end of March, I found that only, we were able to build only for, for only about 4,000, not even 4,500 families. Well, how could I do my 1 million then? It was impossible. So I decided to launch this zero donor program. Now the zero donor program doesn't rely on anybody from outside. It's all like the, we talked about the, the stove yeah. where the community pays the, the people who come and guide them like the barefoot entrepreneurs and they are able to start doing things themselves. So you won't believe, uh, and this is a slide that shows how my stage one and stage two can be taken up by people themselves, because I have all these trained bees, uh, I, you know, people start paying them and they're learning how to fend for themselves. And I have to tell you that I've reached stage one for at least 32,000 families in the last two months, which is being carried out by people themselves. It's the same kind of people who become barefoot entrepreneurs, who've gone through the same disaster just a few months ago. They go with a great deal of empathy with the people that go and help. They train them, they you know, tell them what to do, and they charge a small amount of money. But that small amount, which may be 10 or 15p, because the number is so large, gets them a substantial amount of money, so they earn. And so 
we are going right ahead. They've started building toilets. They're already into stage two, many of them. And hopefully they'll also build their own room, their own little house. So that's what I think is possible. I call it potential in poverty, which nobody somehow, or at least most people have overlooked that. So it's all about building capacities of people. We, it's not about charity. It's not about giving handouts. That is the most demeaning action that you can take with anybody. And why should anybody be in that state to have to beg for anything or be given anything as a beggar? So I'm all for building up their capacities. They are willing to learn. They're all good people. They want a better quality of life. They may be poor. They may be non-literate. But they have tremendous capacity to learn. And that's all we need to do. So that's what I want uh, everybody who wants to help. That's what would be good, to somehow invest into people's own capacities. And uh, of course, there are many needs. But you know, again, it doesn't have to be cash or grants or, or money. It can be in terms of kind. Mm. Lots of potential of helping in the right way. And then nobody will be a beggar. Amazing. Um, one of your projects, which is the Ngori Berg Housing in, Lo in Lahore, is the ho social housing scheme aimed to provide housing for medium and low income families. And then you also have the army mud barracks, um, which started as a prototype demonstrating technology. So innovation, experimentation came into, into fruition, um, especially when it came to the extreme climate issues in the region. When you first out, set out with these projects, what was your first impression and how did you, um, how did you have the willpower to just keep going? Of course, it was very early in yeah. my career. <laughs> We're talking now early 70s. And um, uh, when I look back, um, you know, I was brought up in a very kind of uh, privileged area, rather secluded, not knowing anything much about my culture. I, had, I, was, I think I was the first generation of people who grew up after independence. So we just, you know, the colonial rule had ended. And, uh, and we were you know, growing up, but the, the, I think the, the standards and the way uh, 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 the rulers behaved was still lingering among, my, uh, among many of our people. And my father was one of them who'd served with the British. So very much influenced by British culture and you know, what modernism meant. And then of course I came to England and then I, you know, after of course, when you are uh, being trained, uh, at least even at that time, and I'm not sure whether even today, uh, there's much discussion about what the other part of worlds need. Mm. It is all about really uh, you know, becoming a, you know, you know, that architects are supposed to have the egos and they should behave like God and just say whatever they think is the right thing and they do it and you know, uh, get ahead of their own whatever creativity that they have. So I went back with the same kind of ideas and thinking, well, you know, everything is in the West is the one that we all have to emulate. And remember, we're still, we're still a post-colonial generation, just, just about, you know, very new. And then I go back to my own country and I get a chance to go and visit old cities, which I had never done before when I was growing up. Nobody was, we were not allowed to go into those areas. Those were native areas. So, I now got a chance to go and see, and I was struck by this amazing kind of life in the cities, the walled cities that we have, really old ones, like Lahore and Multan and Tata. And I suddenly found there was a new world that I had not known about. So when the chance came for the Anguri Bark that you mentioned, it was the first social housing that I was doing, and I think the first one by that socialist government uh, in the uh, you know, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, this is this whole strip of, of a kind of a storm drain, if you like, where there would be flooding every, every year uh, with the monsoon rains. And the government was interested to provide housing for the poor for the first time. But the standard methodology was to put up these three-story or five-story walk-ups. And I never believed that that was the right way to live. And especially after I'd seen my old towns, I, know, I knew that uh, they were all very close together. They were, uh, uh, they were open to sky terraces. There were people who had another life. 
And uh, mind you, because my father had been instrumental in setting up many new cities in huge areas in, in uh, or desert, basically. And I'd lived there and I'd seen that the new modern way of planning, the gridiron pattern and white streets and for vehicles, didn't somehow work. It had no life. It was very sterile compared to, you, you know, yeah. my old towns. And so I think I learned a lot during that time. I sometimes call it my unlearning or relearning phase because I had to understand about my own self, which I had not known before. And I think that's where all this interest in heritage and everything came about. So this uh, was a large project and I managed to do it. It was very, had to be very inexpensive because there was not that much money. Uh, but that taught me a lot about women because for the first time I was able to go and talk to women who were really disadvantaged, who were marginalized. And uh, I, I learned from them that for them, of course, their family, the children and how they, that was important. So when I, I designed this particular project and uh, you know, we discussed it, there was a whole assembly in uh, this fantastic paradisal garden called Shalamar Gardens because it was socialist uh, finance minister who led it. And women asked me, they said, well, you're putting us up into these walk-ups, but where will our children, or where will I, our, our chickens go? Now, it may mean nothing to some people, but that meant a lot. That meant they want, they were concerned. How will they be able to feed their kids? Because with so little, if you don't have much resources, then you scrounge it out for small things. And eggs are a good you know, source of nutrition. Mm -hmm. Or that you can grow vegetables in an, you know, on the ground mostly. So I had created these terraces. And I said, well, this is where your, your chicken will roam and you will have your vegetables growing and also your children can play. So I learned at that time that women's needs are the uppermost, have to be. Because they're the ones who spend most of their times in their homes. And this is where they look after their kids. So if you put them up into these matchboxes, I call them, because if your resources are limited, you will make very small cubicles or small, you know, one room flats or something. And nobody can live in those really. Mm. But this open to sky terrace will give you this added space. So in my country, where there's so much living is done outside, that's the way to go. But maybe even now, even here, maybe after COVID-19, I think things are changed here too. I see, you, you know, you're using outdoors much more than ever did before. And so, yeah, so we have to change how we build now, I think. Do you see the impacts of your work within um, the women that you talk to or the women that are now being educated and are learning new tools? I think because I found, and I, I, I say it actually now because people don't know, that in the humanitarian field, there are not many women there who will go to the field. So when I first started in 2005, I found that, and that was a, a major disaster for us. There was this uh, earthquake of 7.6 Richter scale, the worst ever anywhere, I think, by this, until that time. There were 80,000 lives lost, and there were 400,000 families that were displaced. So when I went very early, these were these women, uh, and, and this is a northern area where this is mountains everywhere, very hilly, and there are hamlets kind of, you know, at some distances on each peak, you would have a, you know, a few houses. And women would be totally alone, sitting on the debris. There was nothing around them. And nobody had ever come to ask them how they were. But because I was a woman, and you must understand my society is very restrictive for women, so nobody could enter, no man could enter. But I had the privilege of being a woman, and I could go anywhere, and nobody could stop me. So that's when I understood that I have to keep women's needs the uppermost in my mind. Because I was the only one who could do it as a woman. And if I didn't do it, then I would have failed in my own duty in a sense. And I also found that because for generations, it's probably the same everywhere in the world, women have not had a chance to prove what they could do. So once you give them a chance, then they will do everything possible to do the best they can do. So all of my projects that are successful, whether it's the chula, whether it's the toilets, whether it's the home, they are the ones who lead it. Because they need all this. And you now that we start a saving programs, who is saving money? Not the men. It's all the housewives that are doing it. So 
I have, you know, I have great regard for women. I think they are the ones who will really make a difference and do, actually. And do you see um, any notable women at the moment that are a force to be reckoned with, I would say, that are very inspired because it comes across like you're very, you've got a lot of fire in you and um, it's very, very inspiring. And I'm also just thinking about this kind of ecosystem that you're creating, which is built on understanding um, equitable um, economies, but then also making sure that women understand their kind of womanhood. They understand um, how to pave the way for others as well. So I'm just wondering if you've seen any kind of like notable people in your communities um, who are really like inspiring other people in the same way that you've inspired them. Well, I don't know whether I've, I've really inspired them, I have to say, because I'm as much of an alien as anybody else to go into these communities, okay? So it's, they listen to me, but really the ones that my icons are the ones, uh, there's one woman who, who is instrumental in making at least, or helping guide at least the making of 50,000 of the stoves. And today she's a millionaire. Right. <laughs> <laughs> She charges only 200 rupees, which I don't think is even 50p, <laughs> right? And, but she's done so many. And, and because it's such a wide net that she has somehow got, you know, because she, it's amazing what she did. And, and, uh, and, and so she's an icon. And she's the one who still goes ahead and she teaches. And now there are many others that are, that are, that are coming up. So we have to understand that if you build up capacities of people who have nothing, they have the potential of doing really well because the scale is so vast. So yes, I've got lots of these women now. Love who will be, and uh, in fact, there were two of them who came to London in the Granary Square. I don't know whether any of you had the chance to come and see when we, these young students of architecture from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and also from, from the UK build this little, bamboo structure that I designed and we trained them all. And my two women came all the way and they built the stove and beautifully decorated it in the middle of Granary Square near Charing Cross. And it was a winner. It was all done right there and decorated beautifully. They're international now. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question I'd like to ask is um, mainly about what do you think architecture can do and what do you think it can't do? Uh -huh. Well, I'd like to ask you a question. What is architecture <laughs> cannot do? I mean, I think the field is wide open for architects. Uh, whether it's the environment, built environment or wherever. Uh, whether it's uh, helping people to live better, have a better quality of life. Whether it's communities. I think architects are the best suited and the best trained for dealing with all that. And that's what I keep on saying. I think architects should be there because they will lead the whole process. And they must. Because who else can design as well as you guys can, can do? Who else can bring communities together and know how to, how to deal with all kinds of different factions and different, I mean, you all dealt with consultants. You, ha you know how to uh, be able to have your will, uh, you know, being taken seriously. So why can't you do it with communities? You do it. And you're the only ones who know about context. How do you design with whatever you have available? Whatever the context might be, and you know it has to be. Every time you have to have a different solution because the context is different. So why aren't more architects, more activists, becoming more activists, getting there, wherever you find there's a need, whether it's the community or whether it's you know, whoever because those needs have to be met by somebody. And if you don't do it, then somebody will do it who doesn't even know what should be done. So why do we leave the field wide open for others when you can do it? And our young architects need a lot of that work to be done, and they can do it. We need to provide them the support they need. Yeah. Um, I just want to open the floor for any questions and yeah, if anyone has any questions, oh, loving it. <laughs> wow. 
Um, I've never heard anyone talk about architecture in the way that you have, so thank you. Um, I've got a ton of questions, and whilst I think about which one, I'm going to be really um, uh, opp opportunistic and, and take a selfie, uh, <laughs> which you know is going to end up on LinkedIn. I can come down here, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, got, I've got a question uh, and, and a request, actually. So, um, my name's Marsha Ramroop. I work in uh, strategic inclusion, which I've chosen to do in the built environment, and um, I've been commissioned to write the book, uh, A Practical Guide to Inclusion in Architecture in the Built Environment, which um, I hope will provide some tools to this sector to do some of the things that you, you are suggesting. So, watch your inbox for a request to write the foreword for that book. Um, my question to you is, you talked when you were referring to Part W and your nominators, you said um, uh, you hope you know, young people will become activists, and you just mentioned it again. What are your expectations of the older generation who currently hold the power to make decisions? Yes, I think it's a very good question because we have some senior professionals here, so it's probably a good idea to discuss that a little bit. I think the young people today need a lot of support from established practices, from senior professionals to chart out another course for themselves. They can't do it by themselves. They're too young. They need to have some way of earning. So if we just say, well, you go out and you know, do something different, well, they can't because the profession is not allowing them to be mainstream. That kind of work is not mainstream today. So the question is, how do we make it mainstream that if young people want to try out other ways of practicing, uh, we need to have senior professionals helping them. So I think we have some senior members here. Maybe they can give an answer. <laughs> Simon? <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you want to <laughs> answer there. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, I knew he'd write it in this year. I, I think it's a challenge. Practice is changing, and it always has changed. I think um, something like the RIBA, I'll talk about that for a second, is important because it's a learned society. It's not a, it's not a union. It's not a club, it's a learned society. It's important that it engages the next generation. And the way it, it has worked and continues to work is actually to look at new models for education. You can't even make a difference as an architect unless you've had the opportunity yeah. to study architecture yeah. at different speeds, at different rates. So one of the judges, Neil, runs the London School of Architecture, which is about part-time courses, earn and learn. And that isn't... Uh, a second-rate way of doing it. It might actually be a first-rate way of doing it. It's the way it was done historically. So I think the first thing is to actually go to schools and talk about the built environment, and not on our own as architects, but architects with engineers, with clients, and talk to the school children about the importance of the built environment. And climate change is a vehicle that can help drive that openness to that conversation. Yeah. Then to help make the profession more accessible, and then for the profession actually to value itself. So you talked about one of your uh, mentors being an inspiration, but you have to mention she become quite wealthy. There is a point that money is also a vital tool, however you might use it. So encourage the profession to value itself in all it does and make the choices about where it earns mon money and where it puts money into other projects that may not earn money. So I think, you know, as practices, I think people do it in different ways. As a learned institution, a learned society, that is one of our prime responsibilities, is to actually open it up. And then also, you know, to, you, you talked about the RIBA being brave, giving you the gold medal. I don't think it was, it was a brave decision, it was, a, it was a good decision. But the point is, by giving you the platform, and although you are well known, and to celebrate what you've done, is also, again, putting that message back yeah, out into yeah. the world. So that's, I think, you know, 
you know, the role for senior members. I'm still young, but I'll ask a more senior member, <laughs> Ivan. <laughs> I believe I'm younger than you. <laughs> so, um, and as a practitioner, I think we certainly try our best to partner as much as we can. And we're very conscious that, you know, our profession has changed and continues to change um, certainly quicker than I can keep up. Um, and bringing the, you know, young talent and putting that young talent forward is crucial as part of that. I ran out of ideas a long time ago, so I'm, it's, it works both ways. So it's a, something I encourage, and I think for me, you know, mentoring and support is the, th the legacy, the best legacy to leave um, in any professional position. I've had my time, and it's time for others. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, uh, it's a great question, and I think we, you know, we can all be doing more. I, I happen to run an office that's well, started off being 100% women, and we've now dropped down to about 80%. Um, but you know, we spend, I spend a lot of my time uh, supporting young architects, encouraging them, mentoring them. It takes a long time to become an architect. It takes a long time to, as you say, to be able to go out and do something that's going to make a difference and, and I don't you know nobody can do it without support but I think of the more we can we also need to diversify our profession and make it make it a safe place for women to practice and so I spend quite a, while, a lot of my time doing that um, and also teaching and uh, taking part in other peripheral aspects of, in the profession which is not just about running my own practice and um, you know, getting work in, it's, it's trying to give back to mm. other aspects of the profession through teaching and through, you know, chairing foundations and, and doing that sort of thing, which brings uh, architecture to a wider group of people. So I think we can, we still have a little bit to offer, <laughs> us old <laughs> folks. I think there was another question. And, yeah. Hi, <coughs> my name is Amit. I'm the editor of a magazine called Stir, stirworld.com, S-T-I-R. Um, it's an honor to be under the same roof with you. It's an honor to listen to you. Um, we've had uh, featured you once on a publication as an interview, and today looking and listening to you in person uh, was a huge delight. Um, I have a very simple question that your sincere hard work has gotten you a lot of international recognition, especially now. Does being recognized internationally uh, equip you with a strong voice in your own country to push authorities and policy makers towards the cause you advocate for and work for? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question, yes. <laughs> well, um, I think the issue in countries like mine is that uh, we are governed by the likes of the World Banks of the world. And uh, they uh, give you huge loans, like we, I believe they've allocated something like five or six hundred million dollars for the displaced people. But uh, at the same time, they're not conscious of the fact that I would, when they build at such a large scale that they will be damaging the planet by their high carbon uh, ways of building, because this is what they are promoting. And my countries are like, uh, they are very, uh, easily they accept uh, whatever is dictated to them because uh, everybody uh, makes some money somewhere there because if it's high carbon and high value materials being used then you know it's okay everybody likes it except that the, des the poor don't, don't get what they deserve so I have no expectation so far from my government to uh, really adopt uh, this kind of you know what I say the zero carbon, as Simon mentioned, zero carbon or zero waste methodologies, because uh, it's all, uh, it all uses whatever is available in terms of in the surroundings of the areas. And nobody really makes any money out of this, or cannot, because it's the people who do, it's all co-building, so people do it themselves. So I, I don't think uh, countries like mine, like Pakistan and many others like us, will really think about you know, changing their direction yet. Uh, we've seen it in the past that uh, many people who were displaced continue to be displaced. 
because the funding that comes in is not really used in the manner that it could have been or could be more efficient. So that's the question, again, that I'd like to ask if there's anybody here from any kind of international system, whether the UN or whether you know, these big banks, the, loan, the, the, you know, the World Bank and so on, or donor agencies. I mean, there's lots of, lots of aid that comes into countries like mine, whether it's US aid, whether it's uh, UK aid, or whether European Union, etc. But there's no mention of how that funding should be really utilized. So there's never even any mention of saying there should be architects who should be designing. So you get the most awful designs because everybody feels that the poor just give them anything. It doesn't matter, but it does matter. And so I really feel that we need to pressurize all these donor agencies to change the way they operate. Unless they do that, do that the countries like mine will never be able to do it the right way. So I don't know what the way is. I, I, I don't know how to, how to influence my own government. I think it's very difficult. But if somehow we could influence the donor agencies and the UN system, then maybe there's a chance. Uh, I don't know whether we can do that. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here today. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Um, for this opportunity. Um, first of all, I'm just totally blown away by the work that you're doing in Pakistan. I should say that I'm British Nigerian architect. And what you say about the role women play in architecture is so vital. Um, when I started studied architecture, there wasn't anyone who looked like me um, in my course. And when I finally qualified and um, then decided to take up architecture and practice, it was still the same because I was working here in the UK. Um, I should say that I have, um, I, was one of, I was the first woman, black woman to be elected to the RIBA Council, the first RIBA Vice President. And so, excuse me, what did you say? Yes, I was, I was the first black woman to be elected to the RIBA Council vice president and to run for president of the RIBA. And this was in 2002, over 20 years ago. Now, what I'm really interested in is what you're doing, which is about making a difference to other people's lives, using that knowledge and that confidence to be able to inspire other young architects who look like me and who don't have that representation here, and women especially. And it is a challenge because what you said, which was really important, is that the senior architects who are women, who are of color, tend to be, I think, largely ignored. And we are important for those coming behind us because of the, um, the not just the recognition, but the inspiration that it gives. It makes them feel that, ah, oh, I could do that. Just like people seeing you here today thinks, ah. Oh. And I should say, the way in which I've been challenging this is by having debates that showcase women, people of color in this country on platforms, something called Let's Build. We started for four years. And we're pioneering a mass housing, um, affordable housing scheme in, in Nigeria, where I'm from, to do exactly what you're doing, which is using ordinary materials. So I think the question that I'd like to ask you, going back on that, is that we are people like me are here trying to do that. My colleague Yasmin here was with me on council. And the question is, how do we get the establishment here to recognize our voices? Because I do think that the senior voices, which are the voices that can really turbo boost what the young people are doing, how can they get to hear and understand and appreciate and utilize those skills, that experience, that confidence, because you know architecture is all about the confidence and being able to you know, build the confidence of your client. How do we get the establishment to recognize that in a meaningful way? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, Alicia, the question is for you. Why <laughs> me? <laughs> you know the context here. You know better how to deal with that. I mean, I can try. 
if anyone wants to collaborate with me on this, open. I think there's another hand, some hands. So I'll definitely be asking you as well. Um, oof, I think. I think what you mentioned, Annette, in terms of senior leadership and all the work and advocacy is really important, especially in this context. And I think it does have a lot of influence in different regions, especially, um, and I say unfortunately, um, when it comes to certain governance structures um, south of the equator. And, um, and sometimes it's almost as if um, people don't really recognize the work and the production or the, the challenges that you as an architect or you as a designer go through solely because maybe you haven't won an award and it's not on A, B, C, D, F, G. But I think that it's really important that we are able to acknowledge when we're going through times of celebration, times of um, recognition, and then also, and also be able to understand that it takes a long time to get to this process because it is a very long course. So I think from what I've seen and what I hope to continue to see is people and especially women still being encouraged, still being confident and not letting certain things get to them so it becomes very personal, but allow them to get to a point where they feel that they can continue. And if it means going a different direction, it doesn't mean that they're going to be there for a long time. It could be something where they're just trying to experiment and trying to innovate. Um, and so I think of a lot of what you've said, Yasmin, as well, has been about this kind of understanding of discovery. So being able to discover um, what it means to be in Pakistan and go to different regions and understand the importance of certain structures that have been there. Maybe there's kind of colonial ties. Maybe there's narratives that we haven't really understood yet. But understanding our cultures and celebrating them and putting them at the forefront, being courageous and starting a website or starting a platform or starting whatever it is that we need to do to make sure that we get there and really collaborating and creating support structures if we don't have it. And I think eventually we will get there if we continue to shout louder, if we continue to raise our voices, if we continue to beat against all these different drums. So I think just from your experience and from the work that you've done, it's a catalyst for the next generation and there's many of you in this room who could do incredible work and will continue to do that work and you shouldn't feel discouraged at any point just because maybe someone in a specific area um, or even leadership feels that they maybe say something that's maybe disappointing to you. You should continue and understand that that's just part of the process and that's kind of a circle of life. <laughs> I don't know if that answers. Firstly, uh, my name's Senna. Thank you so much um, for that. That was super interesting. It makes me very proud to have some shared heritage. Um, I, won I thought it was really interesting where you talked about where you went into those communities and you felt like an alien. Well, you were an alien. Um, and I think that's really important because um, what's happening a lot in this country is that uh, larger practices hire or team up with smaller practices who are diverse so that those diverse people can talk to diverse people in communities. But we're still aliens. And I think it's really important to highlight when you go into a community, whether you have a shared uh, gender, shared uh, background, uh, class, whatever it is, um, you are still slightly foreign and it's almost finding that balance that's important. But my question to you is that, I, from my experience, I see a lot of architects go into those situations and feel very uncomfortable and not know how to connect with those people. And often they just hire other people to do that work. And you obviously went and did that yourself. And do you think that is kind of intrinsic to the role of being an architect? Or do you think, you know, some people just aren't good at that and that's okay and others can take that role on? Or my, yeah, my question is how do you feel about that and your approach around that? I mean, architects going into communities, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I probably won't be able to answer the question fully because I couldn't really understand fully what you were asking. But I do believe that there are great needs everywhere because there are disparities everywhere in the world. And uh, your country is no different from what I understand. And I think architects have a role to play in communities if you were to go there and find what the, and, and explore what their needs might be. 
A lot of times I think um, a lot of people feel that architects are for other, to design for other people, not them. And so they are very hesitant to ask architects to do something for them because uh, uh, this is the role that I think everybody feels the architect has, which is to uh, you know, really work for uh, more established kind of uh, whatever concerns. Uh, but I think today in every country, from what I understand, and yours too, I think there's a great need in communities to be helped to be able to survive better in a better manner. And uh, design issues exist here as well as anywhere else. So I, I don't know how the, the profession can work here because you have lots of rules and uh, they are, you know, you have principles to follow. So perhaps uh, uh, there should be a review of how if architects go as, as uh, entrepreneurs into communities and try to help people and if somehow the communities themselves could actually pay their fees. But I think there would be a time, I think people are willing to pay for the services they get. At least I'm experiencing this in my own country with the poorest of the poor even. So maybe this is one thing, some aspect that needs to be explored here. I mean, I can't say really how it can be done, uh, but I'm sure this is something that young architects do want to do, can do. And, and perhaps this is something that we need to think about. I don't know. There was a mention of uncomfortability, and I'm just wondering if that is actually a good thing or a bad thing in terms of being in a position where maybe there are just a lot of narratives that you might be alien to. There could be a whole new culture that you have to adapt to and learn, um, and you have to actively listen so the craft of 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 listening and understanding the needs kind of like what you mentioned about those women um, and understanding their needs of okay they need a space to um, have their chickens and and um, have their children so I'm wondering if you feel that the uncomfortability is it is it a good thing that architects are feeling this or is it a bad thing or is that like a sign for us to actually do better I think architects have to do a lot of listening, actually, if you want to work with communities, because we don't know the, the real problems that exist there. And I've, I found that when I went in there, I, as I said, I was like an alien. I had no idea about how they lived. I'd never seen poverty at, at close quarters. And uh, in 2005, it was a totally new world for me, because I'd not known that world where I was. And so, Again, I had, to, I had to learn a lot. I had to listen a lot. I had to understand what their needs might be because nobody says they have those needs. They don't know themselves they have those needs. So a lot of times you have to explore and you have to see and you have to try to deliver because finally we have to deliver as architects, right? Whatever we are doing. And you must deliver, deliver, deliver it right. You can't, you can't sort of fudge the whole thing. So you have to be a good listener and I think you can do it. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's, this is a great thread of conversation. Uh, I'll change my question. I'm from Karachi. Oh. Uh, thank you so much. Rahgurar is a great idea. Just in line with this, what we are talking about right now, do you think how soon can we replicate and have thousand more of these streets in Karachi. In light of your experience, I think it would be great for all of the younger architects to also learn how you get something done. Because at all times, human beings are the biggest limiting factor. Uh, if you can share from your thing, how difficult is it? Because nobody will doubt that we need so many more of these. Yeah. <laughs> and there are quite a few other architects also in that city of 22 yeah. million people, which is obviously in a state of absolute rapid decay. Uh, so what do you think, you know, how did this come about? What are some of the learnings that you think would really help people? How can we get, how can we equip architects to do more of these? Do you practice architecture in Pakistan or no? Do you work there at all? Uh, I work in design, so, mm -hmm. and I okay. teach entrepreneurship. 
So the way we teach it, from what you're saying, architecture has always been a very entrepreneurial-led venture. That's just how it is. Architects, watchmakers, artists, they are the original entrepreneurs before Silicon Valley sort of came about. So, I, so the way we look at it, there is there's always a very strong connection there. So architects have to operate as entrepreneurs. How they get people yeah, to yeah. do? So, uh, you know, I think, as I, as I said, there are lots of injustices in the world. So there's something called environmental injustice as well. And cities like Karachi are suffering, uh, you know, absolutely, it's, it's an impossible state in terms of urban degradation everywhere. Because the city has been left to kind of fend for itself. And it's a city that, I said that this is a city that nobody owns because there's so many people from outside. So um, I feel that, I mean, this project, of course, came about because I, I thought something like this needed to be done in the city. And uh, because the government was not concerned, I got my way. Uh, I feel that because in my country there are lots of voids, so wherever you want to plug in, if you are brave enough, you can do it. And uh, so I did, and of course uh, there was a lot of uh, opposition, the shopkeepers here, but this is a district which has fantastic uh, colonial period buildings. It's all British period, because Karachi really was a city uh, by the, built by, by the colonial power. So we have some wonderful buildings there, and I want to save them all. And I thought this would be one way to see whether we could do that. And then along with that, of course, because uh, you know, climate change is something that affects us very deeply, all of us, but uh, more so in cities that are very dense, such as Karachi. So there's a lot of urban flooding, and there's a lot of urban heat islands. And uh, because we've all learned to use concrete for everything, so you have just impervious surfaces, so nothing gets absorbed. So nothing goes into the aquifer, so everything, like, it's heating up. The buildings, the pavements, everything. And because I believe in zero carbon, so I don't use cement or steel anyway. Since 2000, year 2000, I've not used a little bit of, even a little bit of steel or, or cement. So I wanted to show that it could be done without all that. I mean, this was really to prove to the Karachi eyes that could be done. But what's very interesting, and you will understand better about Karachi, that as I did this, suddenly uh, people who were really against it suddenly became in favor of it. Because suddenly they got clean air, but you know, I've, I've taken my lessons from many different uh, professionals around the world. You know, there's a concept of sponge city. The Chinese, they've run I don't know how many cities uh, where the water is just absorbed. You don't fight the waters. You actually use it for other purposes. So we don't waste any water, nothing goes into the sea from my street. It's all absorbed within the, within the pavement. So there are sponge pavements here, terracotta pavements that were done by my beggar women from Makli, that's World Heritage Site, who we taught how to do this ancient craft. So that is all tied up with that. And each one is beautifully done. If you've been there, you might see it. And then there's a gentleman by the name of Miyawaki who does this amazing forest where they grow just so fast because you plant them very close together. So I've got these uh, street forests right in the middle of the street. And uh, 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 after the last rains, it's been there only about maybe 20 months so far, but after the last rains, uh, they shot up my, some of the trees at 20 feet tall within that time because they are the, the way they're clustered together. So there are all these uh, ideas that are all over the world and we need to adopt them to make our cities better. And that's what I wanted to do. And Touchwood, luckily, I was successful. Now people who are there are enjoying it. There's biodiversity, we get birds, never did visit. I mean, no birds ever came to this area. Now they're there. Somebody has found some beehives. They are certainly uh, butterflies, because they are flowers and plants and so on. And what is very interesting is that suddenly there's a sense of ownership developing. Because in my city, nobody believes they have to take care of it. So nobody does. And the, and Was it always like that in your experience? Now it's a dumpster bin, but earlier yeah. it was Well, I mean, the city has grown enormously, so we don't know really. But the fact is that now they, the, it's the same people who never bothered, who had trash sort of, you know, stacked up like anything. Now they don't throw any rubbish on the street. They take care of it. 
and they plant trees in case something dies, they come and there's the people around who are doing it. So I think what you're saying is right. I think we can take in pockets, we can create the sense of ownership because that's the key to everything. If you can develop ownership, then people start taking care of it and then you don't have to bother about it. And so I wish more young architects would do it, but I think uh, we should just take over the city. I think that's what I want. <laughs> just carry on, you know? Two more. Hi, my name is Sarah Khan. Hello. I uh, studied architecture in Lahore in Pakistan, ah. but I've uh, been in London and I practice in London right now. Um, so lovely to be here and hear your inspiring talk and uh, finally some good news from Pakistan. <laughs> so that's, that's really nice to know. Um, being now almost a foreigner, basically, um, it's lovely to see initiatives like this from Pakistan and actually being now so far away from Pakistan sometimes I personally feel quite helpless, you know, I, I'd like to do something in Pakistan, but how do I do it? Um, and here there are some people who are Asian and there are many different people as well who may feel inspired by you perhaps, you know, uh, similar to us. So for us, what would be the best way to support your work, your ongoing work in Pakistan, the work of Heritage Foundation to, to help even more people? How could we do it by spreading the word or, you know, how do you think uh, we can help you and support you more. Okay. Well, that's very kind and that's, a, of course, a very good offer. Uh, you know, after every disaster, I found that uh, people are doing fundraising, right? And then they're sending it off to various organizations and it's like a bottomless pit and nobody knows where the money has gone. Mm. So I'm really very anti-fundraising. Now, having said that, of course, there's a great need in my country I mean, we need, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of just hand pumps, which will enormously transform people's lives, or just solar panels, or for schools, just monitors and, and computers, and you know, that kind of thing. So I'm very happy if uh, expats like yourself and the diaspora here was to help in sending uh, their contribution in kind. But I don't want it to go to an intermediary, so I don't take anything. I've declared. Ever since the floods, I said, we will not accept any funding. We, whatever we are doing, we do it ourselves uh, as pilots. And then uh, if anybody wants to help, they can come and actually execute the things themselves or give it to the communities. So you've got these women's committees everywhere now. They're the ones who uh, disperse to uh, any kind of vendors or, or artisans, and they do the work. So that's how apart from the 1,000 that, uh, that the Heritage Foundation sponsored or, 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 or we you know, did ourselves, others have been done in this manner. And that I find is far more, uh, uh, far more efficient in the use of the funds that are given. But I wish, and I keep on asking this, and I've done it in Cambridge while I've been there and everybody else, I wish somebody could design me a kind of a, a humanistic uh, interchange like the humanistic Amazon. So that if somebody needs something here, it could be anywhere in the world then, and you with your good heart, you want to contribute, well, do it directly. Why go through an intermediary? Because that doesn't really work a lot of times. So think about that. If you can, somebody can devise that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> because we do need a lot of stuff, but it must come in kind. It must go directly to the people and nobody else. So if you can organize something like that, happy to accept. <laughs> Hi, first of all, I want to start off by saying you're a huge inspiration. You have to speak louder, I can't hear you. Yes, um, I was saying I want to start off by saying you're a huge inspiration oh. um, and thank you for everything you're doing for my country. Um, my question is, um, I completely agreed with what you were saying earlier about rediscovering old cities in Pakistan um, and I wrote my dissertation on um, Lahore Fort and the restoration of Shahi Imam by the Aga Khan. Um, I believe that the government of Pakistan is not doing enough to um, protect heritage and historical buildings in Pakistan. Um, and studying here and being raised here, um, I've seen that you know the way that we um, protect uh, grade listed buildings and the legislation in place to um, restore and protect what we have here um, can be done in Pakistan as well. Um, my question is, um, 
what made you um, make the decision to go back to Pakistan and start an architectural practice? And would you encourage women like me to do the same? Mm -hmm. Okay, then. I, I hope it's not becoming too Pakistan specific now. Karachi and Lahore and another Shai Hammam. All right, but uh, the, the thing is that uh, uh, I think the, the issue. I'm sorry to say, but it's the issue of, of uh, the legacy we've got from the colonial times, which is that the powers that be are the ones that will restore our heritage. So that tradition still continues because Lord Curzon established that antiquities department and of course brought in some wonderfully trained people who started saving, that saved a lot of our heritage. But what we've got, the legacy is that government will come and do it, not yourself. So it's never the people who will, who will actually uh, conserve or, or have the tools to be able to do that. So I want to really decolonize uh, this whole conservation work because I think that, uh, you know, of course, when we talk of the great world heritage sites like, you know, 15th century, 16th century, of course, it's got to be done by high level professionals and that's fine. But there too I find that common people are not involved. They're not engaged in the work. So nobody really takes care of them. It's the, it's the community around who will, who will take care of, of the whole thing. It's the, not the government department, but that's what we rely on. So all the time we feel the government must come and do it, but why should it? It doesn't do it. So why is it that we are not in the field and, and saving our own heritage? I think this is you know, our, our responsibility if we, if we you know, believe in this. So here, in this particular Raghuzar that we just talked about, uh, the walking street, uh, the buildings were in a really dilapidated condition. There are some really beautiful uh, colonial period buildings, the British period buildings, and nobody cared, because nobody thought there was any value in them. Everybody thought it's better if they just you know, collapse. So here the street gets opened up and, and we start cleaning up. So I started off by just scrubbing the facades I led a whole lot of group of people, young people who go on every Sunday, this was our job. And suddenly people began to realize this is of value. And then uh, what we do now is we are, since we provide pro bono services all the time, so anybody who wants to restore their building, we provide them services to see how they can do it. They put in their own money, but we will guide them and, and do everything possible. And that way these buildings are being saved. So I would like a movement like this, so young people like yourself should be there doing this. Yeah, come over and, you know, let's get going. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Yasmin. It's been such a pleasure having you here. And so also, just to understand more about your work, um, the need for us to adopt zero carbon uh, methodologies, and also for us to understand how pivotal communities are and how they actually have so much influence and how they themselves have a voice. It's just for us to facilitate. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's just a privilege to be sitting here with you today. And um, especially because you are post-retirement and yeah, your legacy has been incredible. And I'm really encouraged and I hope that you're all encouraged today from all the conversations that we've had. Thank you very much. Thank you.